Live well. Alternatives to gene therapy and other support. Presented by Dr. Jasleen Jolly, Anglia Ruskin University on the 9th of June 2022. About Live Well. Live Well is a series of events aimed at helping people make the most of life with sight loss. Live Well is a collaborative project between six local independent sight societies. Sight Advice South Lakes, Humbria, My Sights Not, Nottingham, Sight Airedale in the Airedale area of North and West Yorkshire, Support for Sight in Mid and West Essex, Sutton Vision in the London Borough of Sutton, and Outlookers in Huddersfield in West Yorkshire. Morning everyone and um, thanks so much for joining us today. My, my name is Juju. I work for Support for Sight and I'm, I'm one of the founding members of this group and we have with us uh, Dr. Jasmine Jolie from Anglia Rescue University. Um, she was one of our guests I believe beginning of the year and she came back to talk to us um, a little bit more about what's been happening regarding research. So Jasmine, thank you so much for um, having time for us this morning again and it's over to you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, um, so I am now at Anglia Ruskin University. Uh, the reason I've got the University of Oxford logo up there is because a lot of the work I'm presenting today um, was started when I was in Oxford, uh, as I only joined Anglia in October last year, and I'm continuing the work now that I'm here. Um, so, Last time I was with you, um, and the video is up on YouTube, I believe, uh, I talked a lot about gene therapy. So what I, I thought I would talk about today is what happens if you can't have gene therapy. And this could happen for a number of reasons, because obviously gene therapy is very targeted to specific genes and sometimes even specific mutations within specific genes or you might not be suitable for the actual surgery um, or because gene therapy is more about protecting from further degeneration so your condition might be too advanced so there are other strategies that are also being developed um, both for early and late visual problems that are not reliant on gene therapy, um, that can uh, be useful regardless of uh, the background gen defect, the genetic defect. So that's what I thought I'd talk about this morning. Um, and uh, this is mostly based on some of the projects that I've worked on um, with some other work brought in as well. So. Uh, last time I talked briefly about how the eye and the brain are interconnected. So you've got the signals being generated by the eye and then they have to be interpreted by the brain. Um, and only when the two things work together do you actually have vision. So, if, uh, so we can use that interconnectedness as a therapy and from retinal implants, which I'm going to talk more about later, they noticed that some people were getting improvements in vision, even when the retina implant wasn't working. And so this was harnessed in electrical stimulation. So on the slide here, I've just got three pictures and the words electrical stimulation. And the pictures are of a, a mannequin of a head, showing the device in its entirety and it's a, a box a control box with some glasses and the electrodes and then i've got a pictures of the electrodes in on the eyes um so a control electrode is stuck to the forehead and then the electrode is resting just on the eyelid because that is as close as we can get to the back of the eye so some of you may have had some electrophysiology to diagnose your eye condition where we put electrodes on the eye and then um, measure what the how the retina is working so what signals is the retina producing to see how well the cells are working um the so the um uh, this is doing the reverse what, what we're doing is applying a very low grade um electrical stimulation to the eye 
um, very, very low grade. In, and the theory is that by the, the neural cells kind of have a slow death because they're not getting signals. So from not being used, they, they have a secondary loss later on in the disease process. So if you can give them some input through using this electrical stimulation, then you can protect them until later on in the disease, and then they will keep passing the signal to the brain as well. So that's the theory behind this therapy, and the um, especially if you apply this earlier in the disease process, then it can, in theory, protect um, the, the vision that you've got and, uh, for longer um, and help you keep going excuse me, um, help you keep going for longer. So that's the theory. It works really well in animal models. And we did this study across Oxford and Moorfields. So I'd go down to Moorfields once a month to see patients um, on this study. And I'd see patients in, in Oxford, sometimes taking time, uh, annual leave from my clinical job to go down to Moorfields um, to do a whole load of tests, measuring visual fields, measuring um, visual acuity, so the letters on the chart, um, and uh, lots of images of the eye, uh, and to see what impact this was ha having. Um, in our particular study, we didn't really find any impact. Um, there are other studies that have found more of an impact, but I think a lot more work needs to be done. But I think our study was only a year, so it probably wasn't long enough to see what was happening. Um, and at the moment, there aren't many places that this therapy is approved. So in the UK, there's only one practice in Harley Street that offers this um, because of the poor evidence, but then this has been expanded. And now some people, some researchers are saying, well, okay, why don't we bypass the eyes and just apply it directly to the visual areas in the brain? So the stimulation is given directly to the brain. So even though this didn't, I, the, well, this, the evidence for whether it worked is limited. It's still, the research is still ongoing. The point is that there are alternatives that are being investigated. Um, so there is still hope that even that gene therapy is not the only way forward in supporting visual impairment. Then if you go to the other end of the scale, so what if your vision is really, really low and you're more towards the other end of the scale? Um, in terms of visual impairment, well, then there's been a lot of work done around um, bionic eyes, retinal implants. So I've got two systems on the screen here. The one on the left-hand side is the um, Argus 2 system, um, which where they implanted a chip just on the surface of the retina, and then there's an external camera that you wear with these glasses and the camera and the chip work together and the, the battery pack is external and the camera and the chip work together to give you some vision back. And there were reports of people being able to read to get, uh, again with this. And the system that, I, that we worked on in Oxford was this system, the retina implant, which was produced by a company in Germany, which actually sat, uh, it was implanted just under the surface of the retina. So we were putting it where the photoreceptors would normally be. So when the photoreceptors have, have died off, this is supposed to be a replacement. Um, but obviously you don't get the same resolution because we can't fit as many pixels on that chip as you would have photoreceptors. But, um, but so the retina is, is sitting on top of there because the chip slides in, and then you have an ENT surgeon who um, puts the battery pack on the ear 
so above the ear and you plug in the battery there um and that was a nine hour operation but one of the problems with these kind of systems is you're putting an electronic device into the eye which is a salt water environment so the chips would fail after a while um these companies have now folded um unfortunately but the australians are still going strong and this slide is courtesy of my colleague associate professor um lauren ayton from the university of melbourne who i work with quite a lot and who's done quite a lot of work on the uh, bionic eye project in the states and in australia and so they've got a system that sits even deeper in the eye. It's a suprachoroidal um, implant. So it sits much further deeper into the eye. So it's a bit more protected from the fluids in the eye. Um, and uh, again, it works in tandem with these glasses. They've also got a cortical prosthesis. So it stimulates. Uh, so this is from uh, another group in Melbourne, but from the other university. So it stimulates the brain directly. Um, and then you've got a retinal prosthesis, um, which uh, again is super crudal, and that's produced by another university. So the University of New South Wales, which is um, on the east coast of, uh, of Australia. And this is a picture of what the suprachoroidal chip looks like. So um, I've got color picture and an infrared image, and it's more like a, uh, it looks more like a, um, a honeycomb pattern. Um, so the chip itself looks very, very different. Um, and it's a lot deeper underneath the, the retina. And what kind of vision do these get? do these give you? Well, these are some of the quotes directly from the patients that we worked with in Oxford. Um, so what we're looking for from these chips is not miraculously to restore vision, but to improve quality of life. So we're looking for, um, so what one person reported that they could see the difference between the two bus companies that you have in Oxford. So they knew which bus to get, which meant that they got some independence back. They could see where the food was on the plate, so they could eat. Uh, they could eat independently again, um, and they could make out facial features and clothes features and buildings features. So they 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 could um, greet their friends and um, interact more socially and navigate around the local area. So, we yeah. I, I, sometimes we immediately jump to thinking about just restoring full vision, but actually restoring increments of vision can make a massive difference on quality of life. Um, and so, so as researchers, we have started putting more emphasis on looking at quality of life changes and not just um, disregarding anything that doesn't restore to full life. and But it's a different style of vision. So it's almost like learning to see again. So I'm gonna play you this video from one of the patients after she's had the, the chip implanted in her eye and she's learning how to interpret the signals that comes right. from it. Now, if I look up, I'm getting flashing, flashing, flashing. It's like a, a curve which I then assume is an archway. And then if I come further down, um, flashing over there, so that must be the side there. Let's see what comes across here. Not picking anything up that side, but there is a paler chunk there, which, um, may possibly be an open door or just an open archway. So that's one of the Oxford colleges. Um, and 
yeah so she's having to learn how to interpret that vision but once she does she's able to tell what she's seeing in the surroundings um and that's because the the chips aren't stimulating the cells in the normal way like the the rods and cones it's just stimulating all the cells in a nondescript way so that's why um you have to almost relearn how to interpret it could everyone hear that video okay could someone give me a thumbs up yeah yeah great okay so but for me, the most exciting part of this research is that we've been able to develop the tools as to how do we measure vision at this level? How do we understand how to measure quality of life, but also um, how do we really standardize low vision measurement? And there's a whole heap of, of therapies being developed that we call optogenetics. So I've got a picture here which is the traditional structure of the retina where we've got the retinal so the light comes in from the top you've got all the nerve cells at the top so the light goes through them and then you've got your photoreceptors your rods and cones which respond to the light and then the retinal pigment epithelium which support the photoreceptors but actually that's not the full story because actually there are a lot of non-seeing cells embedded within this structure um, which aren't involved in seeing, but are involved in things like the sleep-wake cycle. So, um, so, so things like the, the intrinsic photoreceptor ganglion cell are, are, are contribute to our uh, setting our body clocks. Um, and if we could harness those cells, for seeing, because they, re they respond to the light, but then they use that information in a different way and they have different response characteristics. But what if we could harness those cells and um, make them seeing cells instead? And that's what this whole field of research called optogenetics is doing. So at the moment, there's only been one person treated in a human trial. I think this this field of research is still in very early stages, but where I'm trying to work on helping to develop the measures we would need to have like when it comes into human trials, how do we measure the success of those trials, those treatments? And that's going to be really exciting. And actually, the work we're doing on the electronic chips, because a lot of the vision characteristics from the optogenetics will probably be quite similar. Um, so that's where a lot of that information is going to be really valuable and, and um, really, um, uh, yeah, really valuable in helping us to transfer it to this field of optogenetics. Okay, I'm gonna pause there and ask open the floor to any questions on the biological therapies before I move on so so what I'm going to move on to now I mean this is there, there's other work going on because there's work around stem cells as well which I'm not delving into I mean one of the problems with stem cells is growing the cells is easy but getting them to integrate and talk to the neural circuitry is quite challenging um, and that's quite complex so I don't I'm not going to talk about that side today um but the whole yeah I guess that would be the holy grail um and then there, there is there's a whole plethora of other um research areas as well but actually apart from the biological therapies there's a lot that's available out there now in these devices so when I was at Oxford, there were some very talented engineers working on these smart glasses. And there's um, this spin-off company, Oxite, from Oxford University, were, um, came out of that work. Um, that uh, So this is similar to the, the glasses that I uh, worked on when I was in Oxford. 
the oxide crystal. So it's it's basically augmented reality where you've got the clear display, so you can use your your own vision, but they you can have an enhanced image superimposed on top of that as well. So you effectively make the most of the vision you've got left, but with additional enhancements. And this is now available for sale from Oxite. So this model is called the Crystal and they've got a newer, uh, another model called the Oxite Onyx, um, which seems to be an all singing, all dancing. I haven't seen this one. Um, and it's it's got a uh, USB connection as well, but it's an all singing, all dancing um, thing where, uh, so it seems to be able to pick up faces and text um, and objects, um, has AI integration and all sorts in there. Um, and they have a number of places where you can go try try these out up and down the country um, and uh, have a go at using it before you buy them. Um, I'm not sure of the price tag on these things. Um, and then there are other devices as well. So the other one I know about is Orcam. So this attaches to your glasses. It's a little camera, and then it reads out um, text to you. So that could be any form of text. It could be road signs. It could be labels and jars. It could be um, all sorts of things. Um, there, there will be a lot of other technologies such as though uh, these as well. Um, those are the two that I've interacted with. Um, and then I'm sure many of you will be familiar with CCTVs and that side of things, which I know the, the charities tend to have on display. Uh, so I'm not going to go into those because those tend to be more widely known. Um, and I wanted to flag up the RNIB technology channel because they've got a lot of uh, videos that have um, some good intro videos in getting up and running with tech because so much of modern day tech has accessibility functions built in. Um, you know, basic things like e-readers -re e um, and uh, so e-book e readers and uh, iPads are so good nowadays um for even people who don't like technology and anyone who is more advanced with technology they've got their tech the rnib technology podcast because the field moves so fast and i find it hard to keep up to date with what's new and they so they talk about um all the new apps some designed for visual impairment some just happen to be great for visual impairment. So they're really good at reviewing what's out there, what's helpful, how to use it, what's not so helpful. Um, so I do recommend signing up to this um, and having a, a listen about uh, to help you bring that into to your world. Um, because tech, I think, has, is opened up so many doors and especially now because it's uh, a lot of tech is just used by everybody so it's not it doesn't have to be expensive or unusual or make you stand out so the last thing i'm going to talk about is taking part in research so i've talked about clinical trials but before you get to clinical trials um, and I talked about this briefly in my last talk, was actually there needs to be a huge amount of work to understand, you know, how do we measure whether these therapies are going to be successful? You can have the best treatment in the world, but if you can't prove it, it's not going to, you, 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 it's never going to be translated into a treatment. And actually, that takes a lot of work and people don't realise how much background work needs to be done to getting the right outcome measures, especially when we start talking about um, these um, newer therapies for conditions that were previously 
untreatable. So like RP, like Stargardt's, um, you know, we, we can't use the traditional clinical measures because they were designed for different purposes in mind and they just don't pick up the effects that we need to pick up. So a lot of my time is spent in trying to optimize the way that we measure the conditions that are in clinical trials, but we need to get better at doing that before the clinical trials happen. And so I teamed up with Tom Walker, who's a media professional who is visually impaired himself and produces some great podcasts himself about the visual impaired experience. Um, and we produce this podcast about taking part in clinical research in clinical research that has no direct benefit to the individual taking part, but uh, it does have indirect benefits. And, and this is well worth a listen. Um, it is about half an hour long, so I don't know if um, so. Uh, I might just distribute the link to share and people can listen to it in their own time or do you want me to play it now you can play it play it yeah, sure yeah, yeah, please. hello my name is tom walker welcome to this podcast i'm going to be talking to two people about the benefits of taking part in clinical research recruiting participants for research can be difficult especially when they might not benefit directly from it so hopefully once you've listened to this podcast, you'll understand the challenges and why it's so important to get involved. Let me introduce you to the two people who we'll be hearing from. Jusleen Jolly is the Assistant Professor in Multidisciplinary Vision and Eye Research at Anglia Ruskin University and the University of Oxford. Jusleen's work involves gene therapy for treatments of genetic eye disease, the neuroscience of low vision, and the psychological impact of visual impairment. For new treatments to be successful, a lot of background work has to be done to provide the required information to develop the new therapy and also know how to test it. That is why research, which does not give direct personal benefit to the participant, is so important, and why without this work, the new treatments would not be possible. And the second person I want to introduce you to is Dr. Andrew Mitchellmore. Andrew understands why it's important to take part in clinical research and has participated in research which he hasn't directly benefited from. Andrew has the eye condition choroideremia, which is similar in some respects to retinitis pigmentosa. Andrew is a senior lecturer in health and exercise physiology at Oxford Brookes University. I started by asking him to tell me about his research interests. I'm a senior lecturer at Oxford Brooks. Uh, we're lecturing pretty much anything health and exercise physiology related. So we do a, a broad range of clinical conditions on our courses at Oxford Brooks and also teaching on uh, modules relating to things like determinants of health and maintaining health across the lifespan, physiotherapy and all of those sort of exciting topics. So I have choroideremia, which is a, a genetic eye condition, and Jasleen is one of my clinical points of contact, uh, with, who I've been in touch with now for what, about five years or so, I think, which is quite scary. But yeah, Jasleen has been working with me as a, as a researcher and as a, in, a, in a clinical role as well. Um, and yeah, I've got a big interest in sort of the research side of things because obviously I do clinical research myself from the researcher side of the desk and then I'm a research participant on the participant side of the desk as well so I get to see both sides of the, the process which is a, a fairly unusual experience I think for most people. Uh, Dr Jocelyn Jolly you've just been mentioned there by Andy so I think it's time for you to introduce yourself as well. Hi thanks Tom and Andy I am, I am an associate professor in the Vision 9 Research Institute at Anglia Ruskin University and I've just come from Oxford University, where I was involved in the gene therapy trials um, for choroideremia um, and RP. Um, and I do a lot of the background work for the gene therapy trials on how to measure the impact of the therapy um, so that the trials are far more effective. Um, and I also look at the visual pathway as a whole. So 
what happens when you've got eye disease to how that information is processed in the brain. Um, and then the third part of my research is the psychological impact of visual impairment. Justine, thanks very much uh, for now. We'll come back to you in a few minutes. Um, Andy, um, you said uh, in your introduction there that you're a researcher. You've done quite a lot of research over people's sedentary lifestyles um, during the lockdown, haven't you? Yeah, so, I mean, my background traditionally was research looking at uh, arterial health after stroke, so central and peripheral blood pressure measures and measuring central pressures non-invasively. But whilst COVID-19 has been obviously very difficult for myriad reasons for absolutely everyone, it has created an entirely new research area, which um, have, you know, it's, it's afforded us some opportunities to create some novel research. So yes, we've been doing some research into physical activity habits and mental health as a result of uh, the COVID-19 initial lockdown. So looking at the UK versus Australia and New Zealand. And at the moment, we're looking at mental health measures in people with long COVID who have sensory loss. So the loss of or altered taste and smell and how that over a long period of time can affect your mental health because it's not getting a huge amount of attention at the moment compared to some of the more, more obvious physical manifestations of long COVID. So through the fatigue and the, well, the, the more traditional post-viral syndrome uh, symptoms. So that's kind of a, yeah, a whistle-stop tour of the research background, but there, there's just so much that needs to be done at the moment in this topic area. It's, it's a bit of an untapped area at the moment because it's such an unknown because it's, it's all still going on, unfortunately. I was interested in it because a friend and I, um, we used to go walking during the lockdown, um, probably unusually for visually impaired people, and we'd share with each other how many steps we'd done each day. Um, I think I got to 20 odd thousand steps one particular day, but I realise that isn't typical for most uh, blind and partially sighted people. You mentioned there your eye condition, which is extremely difficult to say. I'm going to have a go at it. Choroideremia. Um, tell us what that is exactly, Andy. What what effects, what practical effects does that have on your on your day to day life? Yeah, so I was diagnosed in March 2016. I think it was sort of late, mid to late March 2016 went in for a, a standard eye test and eye checkup because I knew I needed glasses or contacts, but I'd done the typical thing of just putting it off and just dealing with not having great vision. And uh, yeah, did the, the field test and completely and utterly tanked it. So the, uh, the optician who was, who was running this test was uh, initially not sure I understood the principle of pressing a button when I saw a dot and uh, you know explained it a few times and I did reassure her that I understood the concept but just didn't see any dots appearing and uh, yeah then had a meeting with a an optician I won't name the the opticians I was with because uh, I don't see them too favorably uh, but the optician got very excited because I, I direct quote oh I think you've got the condition I did my dissertation on which wasn't a brilliant way of, of finding out that uh, I had the yeah, potentially a life-changing diagnosis when I thought I was just going into the opticians for a, a standard eye check and to get some glasses. But yeah, day to day, it manifests in the earlier stages as blind spots on the periphery of the vision. So I know that I've got complete blind spots just off center, sort of laterally from the eyeball, uh, from the center of the eye in both eyes. And my actual extreme peripheral vision is all right towards the very edges of of my vision but there are some blind spots sort of scattered about and um, as the disease progresses those blind spots essentially start growing and joining up until your peripheral vision is entirely gone and you're only left with your central vision and then slowly that central vision degenerates as well so eventually de completely depending on the course of the condition it does end in blindness inevitably at the moment although obviously these gene therapy trials are are working towards ending that as an inevitability. But uh, yeah, day to day, it's, it's most noticeable in terms of night vision, uh, in terms of sort of stubbing your toe on things or kicking things on the floor, not being able to find things on a desk in a rush when there's lots of little items on a desk, it takes a little bit longer to find it. Just uh, little annoyances, but then as the disease progresses, those little annoyances become yeah, slightly larger issues and obviously then start affecting your ability to even get out and about. Uh, in the later stages of the condition but at the moment i believe i'm still classified as as fairly mild and they think slow progressive 
although there's still a fairly small sample size of annual checkups for that. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a pain at the moment and it does affect things. So I wouldn't do, you know, go-karting, paintball, that sort of thing. I can't play squash anymore, um, but I can still live a relatively normal life at the moment with just a few extra considerations here and there. I know you're not an eye specialist, but um, I'm guessing from what you know, you would regard it as being fairly similar to retinitis pigmentosa? Yeah, so depending on the clinician I speak to, I get a slightly different definition here. So some of the letters I get still refer to my condition as having retinitis pigmentosa, but I think technically choroideremia is a is a condition outside of that remit. I think from the frown on Jasleen's face, um, the letter shouldn't be saying that at the moment. I can see on Zoom that uh, she's agreeing that it's a it's a slightly different condition. But uh, yeah, as, as to, to my knowledge, it is a it's a similarish condition. I mean, as a patient, the precise classification, if I'm honest, doesn't mean a huge amount to me. It means a lot more to the people who are working with me and, and treating, for want of a better word, uh, me. As a, as a patient, yeah, that that classification becomes less important, I think. But yeah, it, it's similar to RP. Now, you've been involved in research with Justine. Um, tell us about the research you've been involved with and what that's entailed for you personally. Yeah, I've done a, a few a few studies with, uh, with Justine now, and it normally involves uh, a nice wander into John Radcliffe Hospital because I live fairly locally, so it's quite an easy commute. And uh, then I just spend half a day or a day with, uh, with the lovely lady herself being poked and prodded and put in an MRI machine from time to time and doing different tasks and... It's, uh, it's not been anything invasive. They've all been non-invasive research studies. And honestly, I don't see any reason not to do it because all it costs is a bit of time. It's something a little bit different to do with your day. Uh, it's yeah, outside your normal remit. You know, it's nice to have an afternoon out of work occasionally to, to get away to, to do something different. Although maybe I shouldn't be saying that when this is not being recorded. But um, yeah, it normally involves uh, some... A number of retinal scans, a number of, sort of I usually cognitive tasks, um, sometimes while an MRI is is being taken. Um, so yeah, it's it's a mixed bag. It's been I don't know if enjoyable is the right word. It's been as enjoyable as it can be when you are a clinical patient in a research trial. I've actually had quite a nice time doing them at times, and obviously. I've made quite a nice friendship out of it now because I'm not just into patient anymore and we were able to have a, a good friendship based off that those first interactions. But yeah, it's normally half a day to a day and then doing a number of tasks and, and just being observed and scanned at the time. You mentioned there the MRI scan. Uh, for people who haven't um, been uh, subjected to that, for want of a better expression, could you describe what it involves and whether people should actually be worried about it in the first place? I certainly can, yeah. So uh, MRI, it stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And essentially, it's a, I guess you, you lie down normally. If we're, doing, if we're looking at the brain, which uh, I've tended to with Jaleen, you lie down and essentially get moved into what is essentially a large tube. And some people say that they have found it claustrophobic. And I think that's only an issue if you don't really know what to expect. I think, yeah, you essentially lie on your back, get shuffled slowly into, into a large white machine. Um, your head is kept as still as possible. So you get nice, clean images uh, of the brain. And then there are just some, some standard noises and clunks as the machine does its thing and scans and scans your brain. So that depending on what you're doing, the, the duration, I think the longest I think I've done is about 45 minutes an hour off the top of my head. And yeah, you eventually just have to lie as, lie as still as you can. Sometimes you do tasks on a computer. You can see you've got a mouse in, in one of your hands. And you just lie as still as possible and try not to think about your nose itching or anything along those lines and, uh, and do as you're told. You, you're in constant communication with the people who are running the tests. So there are speakers inside the MRI machine and they can hear you as well. So if there are any issues, you can get in touch with them immediately. They're only a, you know, a few, a few metres away on the other side of a wall. And they can keep in touch with you and give you updates about exactly what's happening, how long it's going to take, what they want you to do next, etc. And... Genu genuinely the hardest thing about it sometimes is staying awake because you're lying still for such an extended period of time 
being asked to not move it's, it's very difficult to keep keep your energy levels up in that situation but um yeah i quite again i quite enjoy them because they're something a little bit different and it's not stuff you get to do on a day-to-day -day basis and i mean i find it quite interesting and exciting anyway and i'm exposed to quite cool bits of clinical equipment on a day-to-day -day basis anyway through my job so for someone who's potentially not even working in this sort of field i'd imagine it would be fascinating to kind of get a an inside look at some of the equipment that, that's used in the hospital environment because it's just it's staggeringly clever honestly it's, it's fantastic from your point of view then is there anything to worry about at all in relation to being fed into the uh, mri scanner i genuinely don't think so no i think if you don't know what to expect when you turn up and you haven't looked at what an mri actually involves and you don't know how long you're going to be in there for getting laid on your back and then sort of slowly um, shuttled into a, a large machine i can see how that would be intimidating but if you are reasonably informed before you come in if you ask questions of the researchers before you take part in the study which is something a lot of participants are reluctant to do is to ask questions if you do that beforehand if you do read the information sheet which again a lot of participants don't do and i do include myself in that sometimes um, if you don't know what to expect it i can see why it would be intimidating or scary but if you turn up fairly informed and you're not afraid to ask questions and you just remember that you know nothing is going to go wrong while you're in there it's kind of just like being in a in a sleeping bag that's how i see it you're just lying in a sleeping bag for an hour but it's a 360 degree sleeping bag so it's over you as well you've got you know it's not literally crushing you into this machine you've got a little bit of space to move it's it's not like you literally can't move in there if, if you go in and see it in that sort of aspect instead it's it's a lot a lot less intimidating and scary i think and once you've done it once and you know what to expect again then it loses that complete i guess intimidating stigma completely for me i mean i was yeah slightly nervous the first time i had one because i hadn't had one before but yeah, I, I could spend quite a long time in there quite happily now, as long as I was allowed to have a nap. For people like Justleen, um, research is critical to advance knowledge. What do you get out of it? Because you don't always benefit directly, do you, from the research that you're involved in? No, absolutely not. And I think that's a, that is a difficulty in, in recruitment to research studies as a whole, is this whole no direct benefit. And it's a question that gets asked by ethics committees sometimes as well, when you're passing or trying to get research studies passed before they begin is you know where's the direct benefit to participants here and honestly the answer is sometimes there isn't a direct benefit i mean but for me these sorts of studies are you know maybe maybe there won't be a cure or a treatment for my condition in my lifetime i have no idea i'm hopeful there will be and you know the, the noises i've heard are fairly positive so far but there's no no guarantees in this world but if i want to have children if i want to have grandchildren in the future potentially if everyone does their little one percenters by, by taking part in these research studies my kids my grandkids in the future aren't going to have to go through what has been at times an extremely difficult situation i mean all of these clinical conditions that we can now vaccinate against or we can vaccinate against or we can treat that's only possible because of research studies in the last 100, 200, 300, 400 years, especially in terms of vaccinations. You look at, you know, you talk about no benefit, try looking at research studies on vaccinations 200 years ago where people didn't know if they were gonna die or not when they took part in the study and people still did it. Yeah, the no direct benefit is a difficult one, but I try and kind of zoom out from it and just say, well, just because there isn't a direct benefit to me doesn't mean there isn't a benefit this research wouldn't be taking place if there wasn't a benefit ethics committees don't pass research studies if there is no benefit to them taking place it might just be a benefit in 10 years time 20 years time 100 years time we don't know but yeah i i find that a bit frustrating when people say oh there's no direct benefits taking part when, when you're researching with clinical groups i do sometimes think it's easier to recruit because people are motivated to take part because it's a, a research study that is working towards creating a treatment or a cure for a condition they've got. Personally, well, yeah, from personal experience, I found it's more difficult to, to recruit participants who are maybe a healthy control group, for example, where 
they don't have the condition being investigated. They're really being recruited as a comparison group. But, but to that sort of population, I'd say, well, firstly, it's an interesting experience to be a part of a research study. I think it's something that everyone should do at least once um, just, to, just to get an experience of it. And I think you never know which of these conditions are going to affect people in your family, are going to affect your friends. You have no idea which of these conditions you're going to come across in your lifespan. And if everyone did their, it's kind of like giving blood, if everyone did their 1% contribution or their 0.1% contribution or their 0.001% contribution of doing this tiny act, if everyone did that, the benefits add up so quickly. It's kind of like voting, isn't it? You've only got one vote. Does it really count for anything? Yes, it does. Because if everyone contributed and everyone used their vote, it makes a big difference. And it, it's kind of the same sort of principle, I think, where, yeah, there's, there, there is going to be a benefit from all of these research studies in the short or long run. And you never know when or where that is going to benefit you. And it might be someone you meet and decide to marry in the future, maybe ends up with a condition you were a, a participant for a, a healthy control group for um, 20 years early. You don't know if any of your best friends are going to get diagnosed with one of these conditions further down the line. You just, you just never know. Um, and as I say, the, the main message for me is that no research studies don't have benefit. Okay, Andy, thank you very much for the time being. Uh, Justine, we've heard Andy there talking about the benefits, um, direct and indirect, of taking part in research. What issues do you have with recruitment of uh, participants? Yeah, patients are often very keen to take part in the interventional trials, so where they're getting a treatment, but don't always want to give the time for these other studies. But from my perspective, the other studies are essential for the interventional trials. So uh, um, up to a third of trials for new treatments fail because they're using the wrong outcome measures. So the way they, they measure the effectiveness of the treatment um, it isn't good enough or isn't appropriate to pick up those changes. And then you can't meet the requirements for the uh, regulatory authorities like the FDA, the EMA, NICE. Um, and then that treat that so the, the, you can have the best treatment in the world, but if you can't prove it works, then you, it's never going to get accepted as a treatment for patients in the NHS. So um, that's why a lot of this background work is really essential. And I don't think people always realize that. Um, and so sometimes it can be quite hard to get people on board because they, they don't see how much background work is needed. They just want the treatment. I'm presuming you have numerous conversations during the course of your working week with potential patients, participants, um, and you're trying to persuade them to take part. What do you say to those people when you're having those conversations? Yeah, it's, it's quite difficult. I mean, it depends on which capacity I'm talking to them, because when I'm in clinic and I'm part of the clinical care team, I cannot put too much pressure on an individual because it wouldn't be fair and it becomes a conflict of interest. Um, when someone's approached me with about interest in a study, but then they need persuasion to take part, then I can come in and be more persuasive. But in the clinics, there's a limit to what I can say. So this is why I think it's important to raise the general awareness amongst people about the importance of being part of studies. And it's not just the patients for healthy controls. I often ask relatives who aren't affected who are coming in with um, well, with their relatives, with their partners, um, with their friends into the clinic, whether they would be also willing to give us some of their time to do some of this work. So um, yeah, I do try and explain why I'm doing it, where we think it's going to lead, where it fits into the grand scheme of things. Um, but especially when you're at the beginning of the research journey, it can often be you need years and years of evidence looking at things in many different ways before you're ready for the treatments and that can I think that can put some people off because they don't see that straight road um, that's nice and timely. Where do you go to to look for patients? I mean, which um, publicity avenues, if you like, do you explore? I primarily go to patients in our clinics and anyone who's registered an interest in taking part in research, we have a database. 
um, then I approach charities, I will um, contact uh, uh, newsletters, try and get the word out there on social media. So a couple of my patients have been really good and helped to advertise studies on Facebook for me because I'm not on Facebook myself um, and I'll put things out on Twitter. Um, so yeah, I, any networks that I am aware of, I'll ask them to advertise on my behalf. It's, it's difficult, like we try to target as many places as possible, but um, it's, I, I don't know whether we're always getting to the right, to the right places getting our what, voice heard by the right people. And what sort of research programmes are you running at the moment for which you're actually looking for visually impaired people? Is there anything right now where you, you yeah, think, yeah, we could really do with some people <laughs> to take part? We're recruiting for a, an MRI study looking at Charles Bonnet syndrome. So we're trying to identify where in the brain the Charles Bonnet hallucinations actually occur. Because if we know that knowledge, we can get the disease taken seriously and get people more help and also know where we start to look for a treatment. And there's a fabulous organisation called Esme's Umbrella, who I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're in contact with. Yes, they've part funded the study and they've been incredibly supported. Judith is absolutely incredible. Um, so that that's uh, have, um, undergoing active uh, recruitment at the moment. And then most of my other studies, I tend to capture people when they come into clinic. So uh, this is how Andy got involved in the first place. He'd come in and while he's waiting to see the doctor or have some of the tests, um, I'll often ask people like, would you spare me an hour either now or later so that I can run some other tests um, and collect the data at the same time as the appointment? So what would you say to any visually impaired person right now who's thinking, should I, shouldn't I, not really sure, will I benefit myself? What would you say to them right now? Please get involved. This is your opportunity to ask people who are experts in your visual condition questions. You don't get this much time with a professional in a standard appointment. So, you know, we want to help you. We want to support you. Um, and we need your support to be able to do that. But also, I, I may not be able to give you a treatment there and then, but I can give you information. I'm happy to answer any questions about what's happening, about your disease, about show you some of the test results, um, all of these things that don't normally get um, enough time in the appointment. And, and because I'm low vision qualified and have been working in low vision clinics for 18 years, I always try and help you with any other issues that you might be having, any practical problems, I can direct you to services um, as an added benefit for you, for you giving me the time for the research, I will try and give you more of my time to support you in other capacities as well. So even if you, you, they don't find a cure or, or whatever for your particular condition, you will still at least try and enable somebody to find services elsewhere, support or whatever it might be? Yes, I can, I can use my low vision background um, uh, in low vision care to direct people to appropriate services, give them advice on practical um, lifestyle um, changes that might help them cope better. Um, and I feel like that's the least I can do. But also, if you have any questions about your condition, about where things are heading, um, I'm happy to answer those during the research appointment. Um, so we, we try and give as much to the participants as, as we can, as much as they're giving us um, so I like to think of it as a two-way relationship. Now, this is a bit nerve-wracking for me because, um, if I remember correctly, I think you wanted to ask me a question, and I much prefer asking the questions rather than answering them. So, just lean, go for it. Yes, Tom, I was curious about what kind of research you've been involved in and um, what has drawn you to it or away from taking part in research? Well, when I was a student, I did psychology. So I was involved in a lot of undergraduate um, research then, but that was unfortunately an awful long time ago. Haven't been, been involved in, in much research since. And probably one of the reasons I was asking you about publicity was because um, I don't think I was, I've ever really been aware 
of any research programs going on. And, and perhaps one of the things that uh, I could help you with is thinking of other other avenues of, of publicity so that we can try and draw in a few more visually impaired people and at least make them aware of it. So uh, maybe that's a, a, what they call an offline conversation. Absolutely, that would be wonderful. And also a lot of research programs, especially in um, more rare conditions, are open to people from all over the country. So I have people traveling in literally all over the country. Um, we often, um, when we apply for money to run the research, we cost in travel funds so that we don't leave anyone out of pocket for traveling in and coming and participating in the study. No geographical limitations then, or not many anyway? Not many. Well, look, it's been really interesting to talk to you both, Jocelyn Jolly and, and Andy Mitchell Moore. Thank you very much for your time. And I just hope the people who are listening to this podcast feel motivated to get involved. Uh, Jocelyn and Andy, thank you very much indeed. So there we are. That was Jocelyn and Andrew talking about the benefits of taking part in clinical research. Now, we thought it might be quite nice to finish this podcast with a bit of music. So we've decided to feature a track by the Gary O'Connor band. So, uh, Thank you. It's so strange to hear my own voice there. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, finish up here on um, a call for participants <laughs> for some active studies that I'm recruiting to. So one is at the Cambridge campus of Anglia Ruskin. Um, we're trying to recruit uh, patients with Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, to come in and undergo EEG. Um, we have a limited travel budget for this, so we're looking for people who are fairly local. Um, and uh, EEG involves sticking electrodes around the head. And uh, what we're trying to do is measure brain activity before the hallucination, during the hallucination, and then afterwards the hallucination to see how brain activity changes to better understand what's happening um, in the brain as a result of the hallucination. Um, we have to finish this study before the end of July. Um, so um, if you're interested, please, please do get in touch. The email address to get in touch is bethany.higgins at, um, it, uh, she's put the wrong email address up there. It should be aru.ac.uk. But I will um, forward these details on to you um, Susie to send out to everybody um, and then I've got another Charles Bonnet syndrome study um, in Oxford we have a better travel budget for this study we have uh, a better grant for this one so this is open to anybody from anywhere and we will refund your full travel expenses uh, it's for anyone aged 18 to 75 years old and we're looking for people both with and without uh, hallucinations but with low vision um, and what we're trying to determine is where in the brain the hallucinations come from so that's why we need the comparison of people with low vision both with and without hallucinations and the contact for this is brain at ieye.ox.ac.uk and myself or one of the team will respond um, and then the final one is again here in Cambridge, um, we're designing a new mobility test for use in future clinical trials. So this is open to anyone with uh, inherited um, retinal degeneration. Um, we're doing some preliminary data collection on the 13th and 14th of July this year, the summer. Um, because we need that data to apply for more grant funding, to apply for more fun, uh, money to fund the full project. We've got £10 towards travel expenses. So again, probably more suitable for people who are more local to Cambridge. Um, and that will involve coming in on one of those two days to complete some mobility tests, visual field tests and questionnaires. Um, and please contact um, very veri at aru.ac.uk um, and I will get back to you um, and I would encourage you all to bookmark this specific page because it, because it contains all the details about our active research projects um, and how uh, and then the contact details for any that you 
are of interest and and you can get involved with those. Um, And with that, I'm going to stop there and open up for questions.